setting them up. And in that discussion here in verse 34, he goes on to say then, don't think that I've come to send uh, peace on earth. I did not come to send peace, but a sword. For I came to set a man at odds against his father and a daughter against her mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's foes will be those of his own household. Now here he's, he's quoting uh, from the Old Testament. Um, he who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me isn't worthy of me. He who doesn't take this cross and follow after me isn't worthy of me. He who seeks his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. So um, as you read that, uh, how does that, how, how do you relate to those verses? They seem somewhat on the surface to be a little harsh, maybe. <laughs> is this Jesus out of character? Or what is going on here? What is Jesus really getting at? Reminded of the proverb that people say, "Misery loves company," <laughs> and sometimes you know those those things you know show up, right? And so yeah, so here Jesus is saying he's going you know, to bring the sword, uh, but that you're right, that division is kind of that battle that sometimes we feel inside or even within ourselves that we feel this battle that um, I know I shouldn't do this, right? There's all of a sudden because I know Jesus, that battle is now very real. It's it's, it's prevalent. I can see it. Whereas before, I didn't have the, a problem with certain things, right? So, um, yeah, so um, it's really more about allegiance, right? I think the lesson is it's really about allegiance that Jesus is talking about in, in, in those verses in Matthew. Enemies, that's right. By, and I think that's you know well put. It's like by choosing to be align ourselves with Jesus and follow Him, it puts us kind of at enemies and at odds with the world, with all the, you know the, those who do not agree with that. It puts us at odds uh, with them. Um, um, so um, you know, uh, Jesus kind of sets kind of. First things first, kind of giving his disciples as they're going out, he's giving them, you know, this 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 advice. Uh, but it's also this allegiance is, you know, I think reminiscent of a relationship, you know, because if you're going to align yourself, you're not going to align yourself with somebody if you really don't have a relationship with them, right? If you're going to go to war or battle, you're, you're not going to do that unless you really feel like you're you're connected uh, with the cause. So this idea of worthiness, I think, in, in the verse, he says, you know, you're not worthy of this. So worthiness uh, relates to uh, uh, relationship. Um, in Monday's lesson, um, it goes into selfishness. It talks about selfishness. Um, and the example that it uses um, is an example uh, that's found in uh, Luke chapter 12, verse 13. Um, and this is, you know, Jesus... Um, he, he is uh, talking in somebody in the multitude. It, it, so it's basically he's, um, you know, Jesus was he's teaching his disciples, and then somebody from the multitude asks him, asks him a question. Uh, comes to him, he says, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me judge or arbiter over you? He said to them, Beware, 
keep yourselves from covetousness, for a man's life doesn't consist of the abundance of the things which he possesses. He spoke a parable to them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man produced abundantly. He reasoned within himself, saying, What will I do, because I don't have room to store my crops? He said, This is what I will do. I will pull down my barn and build bigger ones, and there I will store all my grain and all my goods. I will tell my soul, So you have many goods laid up for many years. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, You foolish one, tonight your soul is required of you. The things which you have prepared, who will they be? So is he who lays up treasures for himself and is not rich toward God. So, interestingly enough, um, you know, somebody comes here uh, and, and you get to immediately, Jesus goes to the motive of, you know, the, the, the brother who's, you know, asking him. And, and so, you know, he says, you know, to divide the inheritance, you know, uh, and so Jesus immediately goes to the heart of the issue, which is selfishness, covetousness, and, and, he, and he then he tells his story. Um, and, and then he ends by saying, you know, you know that um, you can lay treasures for yourself, which can be, not be rich for God. Or another way of, that I look at it is that, you know, um, if you are only interested in worldly material things, you know, those things that are just of this world, um, you're you're laying inside these these things that eventually we know that they're gonna the moth says you know they're gonna they're gonna rot they're they're, they're gonna perish they're gonna they're gonna burn and so again these is pointing again to the bigger picture of the long term to view um, our life in terms of eternity and to say like you know what is it that you might gain your have riches here today but then you know you lose your soul what benefit is that right. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. So it, there is something like that, right? That somehow you're never sat, quite satisfied. I think there's a proverb that talks about, you know, somebody who's just kind of constantly going after it. Like you're never sat, quite satisfied. You always want more and more and more. Um, do you agree? Uh, in the in the lesson in Monday, it, it had a statement in there at the beginning. First, uh, it said, "For most of us, selfishness is as natural as breathing." Do you agree with that statement? <laughs> yeah, um, you know it, it's um, you know selfishness is one of those things that I I think like in, in my dealing with employees and I have employees and I'm working with them. Uh, we just got through doing reviews, you know, so in terms of performance and, and things. And usually, people tend to evaluate themselves a lot higher. You know, then and then, but then others, you know, tend to be more um, measured. And so it's interesting when you go through that process to see how people, uh, when they are doing a review, like where they, where they kind of fall in that spectrum. Some, you know, think that they, you know, uh, deserve a lot more, um, and, and others are kind of more quiet. You know, they're like not quite as. Braggadocious, you know, verbose about themselves. You know, they're just a little more quiet, you know, quiet about those things. Um, but, but nonetheless, you know, when it comes to reviews, it's kind of, they, they equate to salary, right? So everybody wants more. <laughs> everybody wants more. And so, you know, um, when you're on the other side of the table, you're you're you're, you're doing an evaluation and you're you know, hoping to be able to hear you. But sometimes, you know, you get some of your raise and you're like, oh, that's not good enough. And so. You know, a lot of times, you know, we have to say, well, we'll go back, we'll evaluate it, and get back to you, right? Um, and, and think about it. Um, but sometimes those things, those things happen, and it's like interesting to me, just kind of human nature, how um, we're all different. You know, we're, we're, we're all, we're, everybody's different, and there's no one rule that applies to to a group because we're all individuals. Um, and um, but this, I, this notion of selfishness is something that we all have. Maybe I might want to keep more, and they want more. And so, what I find that there has to be, you know, when, when I'm when I'm looking at it, I'm evaluating. It, and sometimes, like, well, I'm maybe a little more gracious. To, I'd be willing to give somebody more because I'm looking at the bigger picture and saying, you know, you could be a lot for me. And I'll be honest and I'll say, hey, you know what? I don't think you deserve this today. That you're not performing at that level. 
but I'm willing to invest that in you if you're going to likewise do it for us. And this is not a five, you know, uh, eight to five job. Sometimes it requires more, and you need to put your. And so I've had conversations that I've, I try to be as honest as I can with them, and I found that being uh, open with them like that helps them just under maybe have a little bit better understanding of you know um, what my expectation is as an employer for them and that I'm not really out to try to you know not make them grow or advance and grow in their careers I want them to do that because the better they do the better I do so but sometimes especially with young people it takes a while to do for them to understand that um, so I, I see that sometimes especially just now with review um, so uh, one of the questions that I thought was really good is how does selfishness affect relationships not only with maybe God but with our families or friends um, neighbors can selfishness um, have that kind of effect I was going to say, you know, what you just described is almost the opposite of what you see in the world today. It's like. And I, and I wonder whether that's also just an opportunity. Right for us to be counter to what we're seeing in culture, you know, there's an opportunity of being of service versus being just you know, only it. right. So in the lesson, you know, it says well, to look at Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. And here, the example, you know, uh, Paul is writing, he says, Have this uh, in your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, existing in the form of God, didn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, becoming obedient to death, Yes, the death of the cross. So here, Paul sets this bar, sets this example, and says, let this kind of mind be in you. Let this be the way that you relate to one another. Um, and he, he sets that, and it's a, you know, it's a bar, and he says, look at what Jesus did. Right? And, he, and he uses Jesus as that, uh, as that example. And the lesson also then goes on, and if you can remember the, the disciples, how many times did they uh, bicker about who was, Greatest, right? Yeah. Um, you know, who, who's, who, who's the greatest? Who's going to be, you know, first in the kingdom? Um, you know, it was, it was something that was pretty, pretty constant. Um, it, it seemed like, you know, um, that you know they wanted to be first. But it seemed that the example here is that um, Jesus' example was one that he humbled himself and became a servant. Totally the opposite. Um, and, God, and, and this is also opposite of God's kingdom. God's kingdom is not um, uh, that he was establishing. wasn't what the um, Israelites and the Jews believed it was going to be. And the disciples themselves they thought they were, he was going to come in and like all the other messiahs, because messiahs are, you know, they, they, they free the, their people, you know, and so it, that he, they were going to be able to take them. Somehow they thought it would be whether it was by force or just 
establish a new kingdom here on earth. And that was so far uh, different than what Jesus was doing. He was establishing his kingdom, but it was not uh, the way that they were expecting it. Um, yes. So, um, it, I think that there's, uh, it, it's, a, it's a good question because it, it, it's not just your specific condition, but how do you, you know, it, it, it figure, as a whole, how do we, how do we deal with selfishness? And unless we are converted, you know, unless we are renewed by the Holy Spirit, you know, our heart still, you know, you know, desires those things. Um, it still, you know, uh, has that, you know, like Pastor said, we're, um, from, from the moment that sin started, that selfishness was, you know, something that just was, and we passed it along. And, and we can nurture those things, right? That, that could be nurtured. You know, in, in the case of somebody who has addiction, the high or the, of doing that, it, 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 you know, our brains are wired, and, and so that, you know, that uh, brief moment of euphoria is something that is desired and wants to happen more and more and more again, and to a point where they can't control it, whether in a drug addiction or gambling, they can't control it because they are um, bound, right? I mean, you can say that they're bound or chained to that condition, whether it's, you know, sin in a lot of different ways binds us, and yet in the lesson here, Jesus says that he came to free us. Uh, the idea of freedom, having freedom and having joy is very different than, but then that freedom and joy also puts us in at enmity or in conflict with the world, with those around us, because they don't agree with what we do, right? To, to, to say, hey, uh, let's do this instead, and like, well, that, that's too boring, I don't want to live my life, right? right? Or whatever, but you probably heard those things, so, you know, there's the conflict that, 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 we, were, that we were just talking about. Um, but Jesus gives us some, I think, clues that are very specific about how to how, how to overcome. And he uses the analogy of uh, you know the sower who goes out to the seed, right? Um, and there, some of it falls on uh, on rocky soil, some of it falls on you know. And so he says, you know, he who has an ear, you know, listen to you know to, to what, he's, what he's saying. But to listen, it's not doesn't mean just you know he has ears, but to listen with understanding, to understand as well what. Saying, and you know, when um, something is grafted, you know, like a tree, and I and I took a picture of this, and I'm and I'm, I'm, I'm jumping a little bit ahead, but I think since you brought it up, it's important. Uh, let me show you this. So, I don't know if you um, any of you seen um, uh, like a rootstock and trees that are grown from a rootstock, right? Where you take uh, a, a the rootstock, which has deep roots, right? It's set you know, set down and has, and has deep roots, and, and you put uh, new shoots in there, right? A little small little thing. Eventually, that shoot grows, it gets bigger, and it becomes a tree, uh, and, and it bears fruit. And God uses this, the, it uses this horticulture lesson to teach us something because it's something that's visible, we can see it, and it's very palpable. We, we can see it, and then you have a tree. Um, you know, you can do this to your own tree, and you can graft, um, you know, different things into it. Like you have a citrus tree, you can do, you know, somebody who has like a, a tree, and, you, and it's, you know, mandarin, angelos, orange, you know, lime, 
they can, they can do those things, which is amazing. But I think the, the lesson for us is that if we are connected with Jesus, he said, if you abide in me, right? I am the, I am the vine, I'm the true vine. And if you abide in me, you will, be, you will produce fruit. We don't produce fruit out of ourselves, but we produce fruit because we're connect, truly connected to right? And so to me, that analogy of just being connected, and when you grasp something, you know, it's, it's, it, it goes in, and, and sometimes they, they'll bind it, you know, they'll tie it together. And it's a firm connection. It's not, you know, flimsy. If it was flimsy, it, it wouldn't take hold. You know, and, and the lesson, like, with the seeds is the same thing. Um, the soil, the roots, you know, like trees here in Arizona, we, we know that if some trees have shallow roots, they'll, they'll topple over when we have a monsoon. We, we've seen it. We, we've lost a few trees here. Or something snaps and breaks, right? Because it's not a, it's, the roots aren't strong enough to hold it, uh, because it hasn't been established. Because sometimes on some of these trees that have strong roots, sometimes you will you will um, stress them. You will stress the trees out for them to go deeper, to have a deeper taproot. You will know, stress the tree out to do that. Sometimes trials can be kind of like that, right? We're we're, we're we're tested, and sometimes we need to kind of dig deep, and we need to hold on to. Jesus and, and really dig in, but to me that analogy is just kind of like, you know, as, as it seemed appropriate to this lesson is that how do we overcome self? How do we how do we do any of those things? Is we have to be connected to Jesus. We have to, and it's not just a minor connection. It's not just something like we're going to do it every once in a while, right? It's something that has to be very. He wants it to be permanent. He wants to transform and change our hearts. So for that to happen, we need to. He grasped it with him. Right? Were you going to say something? Yes. It's you know it's a it's a, it's a tragedy you know um, when, when when that when that happens and the lesson brought out the example of the disciples right before you know the Last Supper right um, it, it brought out that example and to me it was kind of interesting you know going back to read it Matthew twenty seven uh, and in the lesson kind of look, you know looked at Luke but I kind of like Matthew's version a little bit better in approach for this uh, lesson so I kind of yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just kind of uh, rebelling a little bit. Um, but this experience, so here is, you know, so you think of it, this is the last uh, week of Jesus' life, right? Uh, it's the last week of Jesus' life. And right before this happens, um, you know, you have, uh, you know, James and John's mom coming to Jesus and saying, you know, when you come into your kingdom, right, uh, would you make one of, you know, my sons to sit on your left and one on your right? You know, so there, again, this idea of selfishness or ambition, right, uh, being above, you know, the other. Uh, even though both of them were in their leadership, they were in the inner circle, yet there was this kind of desire that came, came forward. And then I just want to kind of just contrast this with um, Judas, because it's kind of interesting with Judas in that upper room experience. So when they're there. The disciples, obviously, Jesus must have been um, saddened by their, you know, talk about who is going to be the greatest, you know, uh, here at the Last Supper. So in, in, instead of this being kind of this communion of us coming together and Jesus, you know, um, spending, you know, this last, eating this last meal with them, 
they were bickering about who was going to be better. And Jesus himself then obviously, as he does as an example, he girds himself because nobody else is going to you know, wash his feet if he washes his feet. And we, you know, we, we had you know this communion service at Longo, which was great because it was just fresh in my mind, reminded me of, of this experience. But it's also interesting to me, like when you read uh, verses 20 to 24 of, of Matthew 27, um, and um, it says, um, but the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for um, Barnabas. Uh, and, hold on, this is not, uh, not the verse. No, 20, no, it's not 27. Um, it's 26, I believe. Yeah, 26, sorry. Um, yeah, chapter 26, yeah. Yeah, chapter 26. Um, and yeah, and then, yeah, in verse 20, yeah. Um, so when evening came, Jesus was reclining at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. They were very sad and began to say to him one after another, Surely not I, Lord. Jesus replied, The one who has dipped his hand into the bowl with me will betray me. The Son of Man will, be, will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better for him if he had not been born. Then Judas said, Surely um, would be, um, then Judas, the one who would betray him, said, Surely not I, Rabbi. Now notice, notice in that, that all the other disciples, and in Luke's version, they're all going around saying, Lord, is it I? Lord, is it I? And here, Matthew catches on, and, and, and Judas, what does Judas say? Does Jesus address him as Lord? No, he doesn't. Isn't that interesting? He addresses him as rabbi, teacher. And to me, this is like, it's kind of profound because he had already made that decision in his heart to betray him. And in that moment, Jesus giving him, you know, the opportunity, washing his feet, he, you know, he, he just kind of, but he already had her treated him as, you're a teacher. You're a rabbi. You're not. A, you're not my lord. And, and that's very profound because out of that root, you know, out of that, that you know, that came out. And he called him rabbi, not lord. And then for us, I think it's the same question. How, how do we relate to Jesus? Is Jesus just the, the teacher, or is he our lord in everything that we do? Do we put him first in everything that we do in our finances, in our relationships? And when we do that. I think that something changes um, uh, in in the way that we relate to uh, one another, uh, but more importantly, how we relate to uh, others. Now, this the next portion of the lesson talks about hypocrisy. Um, so you know, so we have this uh, these ideas of um, selfishness, which we talked a little bit about, right? Selfishness, ambition, which we kind of just touched on a little bit, but it was the ambition that the the disciples had this ambition. Judas had this ambition as well. You know, um, they they had uh, uh, this this am, am, ambition, um, and then hypocrisy is the other one that, that um, the lesson brought out. Um, and so, what is a hypocrite? How do, how do we you know what, what, what do we how do, how do we define usually somebody who is a hypocrite? Person says one thing, does another. Now, uh, I'll admit. Uh, I've been guilty of that. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I've, I've been guilty of saying one thing and doing another. You know, um, you know, and I think that we've all probably have had an experience where we've said one thing and then, oh, and then you're like, oh, wow, that's, you know, and, and, you, and you catch yourself, right? Um, but hypocrisy is, is something else. And the lesson, you know, it was interesting. It's, you know, it said, you know, that, uh, the gospel shows Jesus offering grace to, and forgiveness to adulterers, tax collectors, prostitutes, and murderers. And he demonstrated little talents for hypocrites. Um, you know, and you know, in Matthew uh, chapter six and seven, there's a couple of different examples. Um, and in Matthew 23, there's a list of characteristics that Jesus, when he's giving his woes, this is toward the end, Jesus giving his woes to the, the Pharisees, right? Um, and he, there are there are like four main characteristics. That Jesus mentions about hypocrisy, um, uh, about you know, those 
leaders, the so-called leaders, right? Um, in Matthew 23, um, verses 1 through 13, um, so it says, Then Jesus uh, spoke to the multitudes and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sat on Moses' seat. All things, therefore, whatever they tell you to observe, observe and do, but don't do their works, for they say and don't do. For they bind heavy burdens that are grievous to be borne, and lay them on men's shoulders, but they themselves do not lift a finger to help them. But all their works they do um, to be seen by men. They make their um, phy uh, phylacteries, phylacteries um, broad and large with the fringes of their garments, and love the places of honor at feasts, um, the best seats in the synagogue, the salutations in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi, rabbi by men. But don't you be called rabbi, for one is your teacher, Christ, and all of your brothers. Call no man on earth your father, for one is your father who is in heaven. Neither be called master, for one is your master, the Christ. But he who is greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, for you devour widows' houses, and as a pretense you make long prayers. Therefore you will receive great condemnation. Um, so this is the context, and there are four things that uh, um, that seems to suggest that these hypocrites do. Um, first one that I found is that they uh, um, they bind heavy burdens um, uh, on men's shoulders, but they themselves uh, don't lift a finger to help them. So, meaning they they have a different standard for themselves than they do for others, right? Um, Very difficult. Yeah. yeah. And more. Yeah. And they did things um, to be seen by men. Right. Yeah. By putting people go down, it, you know, and that is something that does happen, right? It sometimes is is a response that we treat others um, bad to lift to to lift you up. That that is something that um, somebody will do. Um, love places of honor, you know, basically, you know, aggrandizement of yourself. Let's say, again, you can see in that hypocrisy, I kind of see selfishness arise out of that. I see ambition arise out of. That. I see all those things that we were talking about come up out of hypocrisy. So hypocrisy is almost kind of a fruit of all these things. If you have them, you know, that's going to be a product, right? Um, and then to be called rabbi or, you know, be greeted by others. Um, we're getting... There's a structure. There's a structure. Mm -hmm. So Jesus addresses that condition, right? And, and he says, Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house are many homes. If it were not so, I would have told you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. If I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will receive you to myself. And where I am, you may be there also. Where I go, you know, and you know the way. And Thomas said, Lord, we do not know where you're going. How can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Um, you know, in John 15, 1, 11, uh, what we were referring to is Jesus basically saying, I am the true grapevine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch of mine that doesn't produce fruit, and he prunes the branches that do bear fruit, so they will produce even more. You have already been pruned and purified by the message I have given you. 
remain in me, and I will remain in you. For a branch cannot produce fruit if it is severed from the vine, and you cannot be fruitful unless you remain in me. Yes, I am the vine, you are the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. Anyone who does not remain in me is thrown away like a useless branch and withers. Such branches are gathered in the pile to be burned. But if you remain in me and my words remain in you, you may ask of for anything you want, and it will be granted. When you produce much fruit, you are my true disciples. This brings great glory to my Father. I have loved you even as the Father has loved me. Remain in my love. When you obey my commands, you remain in my love, just as I obey my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you these things so that you will be filled um, with joy. Um, yes, your joy will overflow. Jesus, you know, saying this message not only to his disciples, but to us, speaking to us today, you know, is that same invitation of us staying connected with him. And because we're connected with him, you know, the spirit fills us. And the result of that is the, the fruits of the spirit, which, you know, Galatians talks about, but also um, it's, it's love is that sacrificial love is the fruit of it. And when we love one another, we are willing to sacrifice for one another. We are willing to do that when we have that love for one another. Um, you know, um, John 10, 10 said, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that you may have life and may have it abundantly. God's offer for us and our hope today that we can live with that knowledge that we have um, a victorious life in Jesus. We can have that. We don't have to wait for heaven, although heaven is a, it is something that we look forward to. Uh, and it's in, and, and it is a reward, but yet it's something that is promised now that we can have that joy, um, and that we can have that. Um, there are many examples of like you know like Matthew said about a good tree and the bad tree. A good tree bears good fruit, a bad tree will bear bad fruit. Um, and you know, for me, just if you take anything away this week, is just just remind you about go back and read these all these parables about trees and and planting. Because they relate about us, how we grow, and how we can, and they all have to do with staying connected with Jesus. So um, we have to stop now. But um, that's my prayer for you this week: that you, you know, stay, stay connected to Jesus. Just make an effort to just really connect with Him, and He will transform us so that we would be more loving, less selfish. All those things come as we let Jesus abide in our hearts. Let's pray, uh, dear Jesus. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your promises, and we thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you are that rootstock, that we can connect to you, and that we can grow, that we can develop. Um, even though, Father, we we all have pains and, and we have different scars that um, uh, we have that we that we bear, Lord. Yet you are able to make something beautiful, and you say that you also will make us fruitful. And so, Father, we want to be fruitful for you as we relate to uh, others. And we ask that you would bless us this week in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thank you, guys. Mm-hmm.